Eastern California. Maybe some of you have heard of those bristlecone pines. Do you know there's one tree there that's estimated to be 4,845 years old? They've given a tree a name, and it's the name of a biblical character. Do you know who that is? It's Methuselah. And for many years, it was the world's oldest known living, non-cloned organism. But recently, it was superseded by the discovery in 2013 of another bristlecone pine in the same area with an estimated age of 5,063 years. Its germination was in 3,051 BC. To me, that's amazing. Now, my maths may not be 100% right there, but it looks pretty close. Adam would have died about 20 years earlier than the initial bristlecone pine that I mentioned, Methuselah. But I don't know how it survived the flood. I guess it may be because uh, it had strong roots, a good root system, because the flood around 2300 BC uh, would have enabled it to have plenty of time to get good strong roots there, hold on for the year. And of course, being up in the mountains, it would be one of the first areas to drain as the flood receded. Methuselah is also the name of a six liter, that's about 1.6 gallons, maybe even two gallons in the, in the States, bottle of champagne. However, the largest bottle, one bigger than the 27 liter Goliath, is the Melchizedek, which is 30 liters. I guess you could work that out, it's uh, about eight gallons, maybe 10 American gallons, and quite appropriate when we consider the identity of Melchizedek, but I've never seen a bottle that big. My intent today is not to talk about bottles or trees, but it is to talk about Methuselah. Methuselah is possibly one of the least considered characters in the Old Testament, and the only quality that most people know of him is that he lived 969 years. You can check that up in uh, what God mentions, Genesis 5, verse 27. Longer than anyone else recorded. Now, there may have been someone else who lived longer, but it's not recorded in the scriptures for us. What it means that it took, if it took five years to circumnavigate the world in his day, five years is a reasonable time, he could have done it 160 times and still spent 169 years at home. Does that put it into sort of perspective? It's a long time that he lived. Let's learn more about this man and his character and appreciate more out of his life because there are a number of helpful lessons. You may say that this is speculative. If it is, well, Many of us will keep our eyes open. <laughs> we all love speculation. And yet there's much in the scriptures that I believe we can draw from the life of Methuselah. He was born 687 years after man's creation. You're free to check my maths afterwards if you like. Not much is known about his brothers and sisters, except that there would have been many by the time he was brought, uh, born when I say brothers and sisters, cousins, and so on as well. If Eve only had one baby every five years after Seth, you know, Seth was her, at least mentioned as the third born, uh, in year 130 of man, up until she was 600 years old, and we don't know how old she was, she would have had 92 babies if it was one every five years. But the multiplication of her children, having regular children, then becomes hair-raising if you start working things out like that. But Methuselah's father, Enoch, is well known. He was talked about in the New Testament, and more information may have been known by secular sources at that time. But let's first go to Genesis chapter five, and we'll, we'll look a little bit about Enoch, Methuselah's father. Genesis chapter five, and we'll read verse 21. 
Genesis 5, verse 21. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and begot sons and daughters. So obviously Methuselah had plenty of brothers and sisters too. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Now that mentions all the days, and we can take it, as in other mentions of the number of years in which people lived, that that was his total lifespan at the time. Why so short? Well, maybe there are some answers to that. So it's said in Genesis that he walked with God. Who was that? As far as we understand, it was the one who became Jesus Christ later on and certainly was known by uh, Abraham as Melchizedek. And Genesis 5.23 mentions he only lived 365 years. You compare that with others who lived 900 years, 960 years, even his son, 969 years. That's a considerable difference. Some believe that his early death, Enoch's early death, although protected by God, as we'll see, uh, where God removed him from danger at a critical point in his life, it may have been linked to Lamech from the line of Cain. We'll get to that particular script, scripture. Genesis 4, verse 18. Let's have a look. Genesis 4, verse 18. It's quite interesting what is mentioned, and consider that Methuselah was Enoch's son, one of his sons and daughters. Methuselah knew what happened and what was going on. He lived with the situation for as many as 600 years, knowing what had happened to his father. Genesis 4, verse 18, talking about the line of Cain. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the second was Zillah. And then it goes on to mention a little bit about who... Uh, this particular Lamech's sons and daughters were, but notice verse 23. Then Lamech said to his two wives, I wonder why he said it to his two wives, but he said it to his two wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. O wives of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech 77-fold. He was expecting retribution for what had happened. And you remember what happened with Cain. God said to Cain, you're going to be cast out of the garden and uh, into an area of wandering. And then Cain had requested God, please give me a mark or something that would enable me to be protected from others. So he did. Here we find Lamech asking again for some sort of protection for an act that he performed. You imagine being brought up in a family where your dad talked to people about the Messiah and the saints coming in the clouds. Certainly a true preacher's kid, maybe the first one ever in the uh, scriptures, Methuselah, the first preacher's kid. Notice in Jude chapter uh, Verse 14, it's chapter 1, verse 14. Let's turn over to the New Testament now, and we'll see where Methuselah's dad is mentioned. In Jude, reading verse 14, it says here, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, and some believe that meant the seventh righteous individual from Adam, but it says here, the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I wonder whether Enoch didn't speak to Lamech and tell him something about the way of life that he had. You can read a bit more about Lamech of the line of Cain, and he started doing all sorts of things, and there's an inclination there that he was somewhat 
twisted in the way he was thinking, in the way he was using some of the gifts that God had given to mankind. So Enoch is also mentioned among the faithful who will rise into the air with the saints, where he is mentioned right after righteous Abel. Let's rehearse that too in Hebrews 11. Let's go back there, Hebrews 11. And reading from verse 4, Hebrews 11, verse 4. It says here, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith Enoch was translated or transferred or moved so that he did not see death at that time. We know he died, mentions he died after 365 years and was not found because God had translated or moved him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That must have been special growing up in a family like that, where your dad pleases God and walks with God. I wonder what kind of stories or uh, information that Enoch said to his son, Methuselah, and of course, his other sons and daughters, I wonder why the other sons and daughters aren't mentioned specifically. Well, we're going to find that through Methuselah's descendants were some very important people as far as the history of this earth is concerned. When Methuselah was born, his righteous father Enoch must have prophetically known of the coming events since his, son can, uh, his son's name can mean, when he dies, judgment. So it was that Methuselah would die in the same year God judged the sinful world with the great flood of Noah's day. So I wonder if uh, Methuselah wondered about his name, like we all sometimes wonder about our names, when he dies, judgment. What about talking with Adam and Eve? Adam, his great, 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 great grandpa, was only 687 years old when Methuselah was born, and he could have spent a number of his remaining 247 years recounting his and Eve's experience in life. Enoch, whose name can mean dedicated teacher, had obviously chosen what way of life he would follow, and he would have taught his son this. So let's consider some of the questions that Methuselah might have had if he was sitting there before his great, great, etc., grandfather Adam, and his great, great, etc., grandmother Eve. What was Eden like? They had perfect minds. They could recall what it was like to be in the garden in Eden. Eden was an area, but there was a specific garden there in that. How were the animals so different than now? Because by that stage, uh, there were some serious problems with animals. They were certainly violent by the time of uh, just after the flood, so prior to the flood as well, uh, that spirit would have been there too. What was it like to walk and talk with God? Because his father Enoch was, so what was it like for Adam and Eve to walk and talk with God and to discuss what the future of mankind was going to be? Tell us about this talking snake you encountered. He must have had quite a bit to say on that and probably... Not only Eve, but uh, certainly Adam would have shown quite a bit of regret as to see what had happened from that time onwards to the development, certainly, of the line of Cain and also the line that eventually uh, came through Seth. Abel had been killed. You lost your second son to your firstborn, 
who became the first murderer. How did you deal with that? How were you able to cope? These are all questions that uh, Methuselah could have asked Adam and Eve. Then your firstborn was sent out wandering throughout the earth. Do you miss him? He may have still been alive at the time Methuselah was asking these questions, if this actually happened. Well, Methuselah in the time also married. He also had children. And it seems like he also understood a bit about prophecy. Certainly took on board some of the things that Enoch, his father, had said. Because Methuselah's son Lamech was born when Methuselah was 187 years old. No doubt he had many other sons and daughters, but Lamech was obviously special. He was one that God focuses on and concentrates on. And he was to become the father of the one that God would use to prolong humanity. So we see the line from Enoch to Noah as knowing the truth and teaching it to their children. At least this is a supposition, and I think it's a reasonable supposition. They were not only, I mean, they were not necessarily all converted, although not all who are converted are listed in the Bible, are they? We don't know who was converted in Ephesus. We don't have a list of their names. We don't have a list of the congregations and who was serving and who was helping. We don't have a list of all the deacons. What about through the Middle Ages? So we just don't know all of the people that God has worked with and who were converted. Also in the time of Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. But only those four are mentioned as righteous from Adam. Enoch is called, I'm sorry, I should repeat that, and I should say only Abel, Enoch, and Noah are mentioned specifically as righteous. Enoch is called the seventh from Adam, as we've read, and sometimes this is thought to refer to seven righteous people in Adam's line who were descendants through Seth. Let's consider Lamech again. Lamech had lived for 113 years while his grandpa Enoch preached. That's a long time to listen to your grandpa talk about the saints and God bringing judgment on the earth. Was he a preacher of doom and gloom? Well, he certainly had a lot of positive things, I'm sure, for those who would listen. Enoch may have been killed by an imposter named Lamech, because remember, Methuselah named his son Lamech. This other imposter, Lamech, was a different man. Lamech died five years before the flood, 777 years after his wife gave birth to Noah. There's a lot of overlap here, so much time, and we don't appreciate and understand what it would have been like to be able to sit down and discuss with people several hundred years old who had the, the perspective of how things had developed in human history. Genesis 6.5, let's turn over there. This is how things had developed to the time of Noah. Genesis 6, verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. This was the general condition of man. And we're told in Matthew 24 it would be very similar to the kind of conditions we'd see in the world today. Now that doesn't mean that every single individual, apart from those specifically named, are evil. After all, our names are not named in Matthew 24, but certainly the wickedness around us is pretty general. Verse 6, And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. You think that the one who became Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Old Testament, didn't communicate this to Enoch, and perhaps Methuselah from his father, and Lamech, his grandson? Although times will never be as bad as in the end days, and we are told that they will be very severe, 
they'll be similar to Noah's days. And so a significant portion of the last 600 years of Methuselah's life, Methuselah saw this developing. He died the year of the flood, as I mentioned before. Was this a case of God allowing the righteous to die, being taken away from the evil? I don't know. But we do know that from Methuselah's name, it seems like he was given that uh, kind of responsibility to live up until the time that God would bring judgment. Let's get a little bit more into Lamech's son, Noah, Methuselah's grandson. Oh, I wonder how many grandparents we've got here. Probably quite a few grandparents. Uh, maybe uh, hmm, a third of the audience look as though they're likely to be grandparents here. All of us have a deep feeling for our grandchildren. And of course, certainly very much for our children as well. But uh, grandchildren seem to have that slightly different relationship uh, with the grandparents. I don't know if you've ever had or experienced that. I know I could speak to my grandparents. I know they would sit down and they would listen. And although my parents would have high hopes and want to say, well, you must do this and you must do that, the grandparents would sit there and they would nod. They'd say, yeah, mm, what would you like to do? They would be very, very interactive. Now, if you didn't have grandparents like that, well, that's fine. I, I was blessed with grandparents like that. I'm sure Methuselah, in talking to Noah at different times, gave an incredible perspective to Noah. And of course, as we know, Noah was living for about 600 years while Methuselah was alive. Methuselah must have been yearning for the peace that would come when his grandson Noah's work would bring a new era. Noah, as we know, was called a preacher of righteousness. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2 and reading from verse 3. Chapter 3, verse 3. 2 Peter 2. Chapter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. Now, sometimes we apply this to uh, scoffers about the existence of God or about the flood. And I'm sure that is certainly partly appropriate. But I think it's also appropriate that they scoff at the message of God's servants bringing these things, God's people bringing these things to their attention. Verse 4, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation, as though there were no flood. And certainly in the time of Noah, they would have spoken to Noah at this time. This is 2 Peter 3, verse 4. They would have spoken to Noah and said, Nah, everything's going on just the same as ever. Why should there be some flood? Verse 5, for this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. So many people even today cannot accept the fact that so much of the rock formations indicate that worldwide flood. Noah and his family found grace in God's eyes, found favor is it possible that Noah's father, Lamech, and his grandfather did not find favor with God? Or is it that they're included in that, but they were not going to live beyond the time of the flood? We don't know for sure. Let's have a look in... Uh, oh, I was uh, mentioning about Noah being a preacher of righteousness. If you turn to Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5, that's where it's specifically mentioned, 2 Peter 2 verse 5 says that God did not spare the ancient world but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. When now Noah found grace in God's eyes, it was a violent world round about him. 
just like you and I. When we re respond to God, when we try to walk with God, just as Enoch, Noah's great-grandfather, did, God listens. God walks with us. We can have that close relationship with him. And there are many details of the flood account about which we can only speculate. But perhaps Noah was given up to 120 years of warning about the flood coming, and we're told that he was a preacher of righteousness, we've just read that, during the building of the ark. And yet only eight people, eight souls, were saved. Why didn't Noah influence more people? Why wasn't he able to do that? Well, we've already seen that just in uh, society roundabout, that they were not responsive to God. Noah's faithfulness and obedience in building that huge boat on dry land must have been both attention-getting and a source of conviction to the surrounding sinful people. Because although you saw this built, uh, boat being built, it was miles, as far as we understand, from any water. And uh, hence, there's been this skit, I forget who, who did it, but it was called Nutty Noah. And of course, we've had this uh, uh, film recently called Noah, which had some amazing inaccuracies in it. <laughs> but it was there, and um, it gave an idea of, of what it must have been like. But 120 years of teaching the truth, you, you know, we might suspect that Lamech who for 113 years was there listening to his son, Noah, and Methuselah, who was 120 years listening to his grandson, Noah, had the same beliefs. Yet only those eight close family members boarded the ark. Is it possible that they also supported Noah with funds and even labor? Since Methuselah died the same year of the flood, some have wondered if he was likewise an unbeliever and perished in the flood waters. But he died before the flood. And we don't know anything of his spiritual condition other than it, that he was the son of godly Enoch. And his son Lamech prophesied with spiritual insight at his son's birth by calling him Noah, or rest or peace, seems to indicate that they understood the sequence of things that was going to take place. Here are an even uh, a few more hint, hints to ponder. God had promised that the seed of the woman would one day destroy Satan. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, or destroy his influence. Genesis chapter 3, let's go back there. Genesis 3, reading from verse 14, So the eternal God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust and all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, Satan didn't have children, not physically, but mentally and spiritually, we know from John chapter 8 that Christ said of some of those in his day that they were of his father, their father, the devil. It was a spiritual matter. And even here, the one seed that is being talked about, Jesus Christ, is also the one who imparts his spirit to you and I. So there will always be enmity between the body of Christ and Satan. So ever since Satan heard this and knew this, probably even before, in his hatred for God and the fact that God had put his image in man, is it perhaps likely that Satan schemed to thwart God's plan? 
Have a look in chapter 4, Genesis 4, verse 7. Genesis 4, verse 7. God says to Cain, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. You should have the ability to discern and rule over that influence, whether it be of flesh or lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, or Satan's influence. Chapter 6, verse 2. Chapter 6, verse 2 says, The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now, various ideas have come forward about this, but we know that angels do not marry men, and so the likeliness of this is that anyone and everyone decided who they wanted to marry without any formal concern of how and when. In other words, it was ungodly in the way things were being done at that time. Satan was trying to destroy the human family. And by the time the flood was, uh, came, Satan thought he had got everything wrapped up. He thought, God will destroy the whole earth. Is it possible, too, that just like in our days, and certainly in the Middle Ages, some of those that God was working with were killed by those who were evil? Possibly. Potentially. Because... As we read in Genesis 6, verse 5, man's thoughts were only evil continually. So if anyone was living a righteous way, they became immediate targets for those who were living unrighteously. And if the earth was filled with violence through these individuals, how was it expressed? Well, certainly on each other, people grabbing what they felt was theirs, but even more so, if like Lamech from the line of Cain... Someone was teaching the truth, teaching that you should repent of the evil that you are doing. And is it possible that that wrath and violence was turned on any of that line? Is it possible, perhaps, that Methuselah and maybe his son Lamech were also killed before the flood? We don't know. Those are some of the things that will be revealed when we are in the kingdom of God. But certainly the violence took the lives of many. It appears that animals became violent and bloodthirsty, and wars must have been as rampant as man's sinful nature had full sway on trying to grab and get whatever he wanted. So would we not be correct in assuming that the violence was directed towards believers, most of all, those who were listening to Noah, I wonder how many people actually did listen to Noah and suffered violence because there was only eight of one family who came through the flood. Perhaps Noah had many more who listened over the years. The only ones left were the eight mentioned. Perhaps Methuselah was the last pre-flood martyr. and When he was killed, God's patience was over. Abel, you could say, was a martyr. He died for what he believed. And in order to preserve mankind, and in particular, Eve's lineage, through whom the Redeemer would one day come, God's justice was finally unleashed after 150 years. And certainly after 120 years of the preaching of Noah. What are some of the lessons we can learn? I think they're encouraging because we see in this room many who have come from the same family called by God and given that blessing of the truth. So I think it's true to say that we can learn that God sometimes works in families, although not everyone is necessarily called, and we certainly see just a line mentioned down from, um, from uh, Enoch, down through Methuselah, to Lamech, to Noah, and that line is mentioned uh, as uh, people who were in the line of, of Noah, one who God saw as just and faithful. Also, I think we can say that God often leaves hints about the righteous. How is it that the parents of Noah, 
grandparents of Noah. And Enoch himself, who walked with God, used the names. Was it only that God influenced them to choose those particular names? Or was it that they also maybe knew a bit more about what God's plan would be? Certainly some in the family knew about God's plan. Otherwise, how could Enoch even talk about the saints who would come with Christ at his return? They were taught, certainly Enoch was, and by, inf uh, by inference, then his children and grandchildren would have been taught by God, the one who became the priest like Melchizedek in Abraham's time. We can only speculate which of the ones we've even mentioned were firstborn. It doesn't specifically say even that any of those we have discussed were firstborn. It just gives dates and lines. And I'm sure that not all those that God was working with are mentioned. Maybe there were more than Abel, Enoch, and Noah. I think we can also uh, learn the lesson that we can't judge the lives of everyone before the flood. We don't know what God was doing. What about after the flood? What about Shem? What about Shem's descendants? Shem seems to have been one who carried on much of what Noah did after that time. And certainly there's a lot of uh, historical inferences that Shem was one who continued uh, to follow God's way to a certain degree. But I believe that we can look forward to meeting Enoch in the air and certainly many of the others at the time of Methuselah, maybe Methuselah as well, at the time represented by the last great day. You can learn a lot in 969 years. And I believe that Methuselah is one who is, has a special place, much of which we are still going to learn about in the future. I came across a <clears throat> something which I would like to make available, if I can find it. <laughs> It's uh, something to do with the names of those in the line of Noah. Son, could you bring me one of those? I know I had it with me. It's probably stuck in my Bible. Oh, there it is. Sorry, it was under my Bible. You might find this interesting. Uh, it is only putting the names together. <coughs> excuse me, and using the possible um, meanings that fit what we have. And uh, Adam comes from a root meaning, meaning red earth or man who came from the earth. Seth comes from a root meaning appointed. Enosh comes from a root meaning mortal. And I'm just going down the line uh, of those that are mentioned in the scriptures uh, through Seth down to Noah. Canaan, or more properly Kenan, K-E-N-A-N, comes from a root meaning spear or sorrow. Mahalil comes from two root meanings, praised or blessed, and God, El. Thus means blessed of God or blessed God. Jared, the so next one, comes down from a root meaning descend or come down. Enoch, comes from a suggested root meaning to inaugurate, dedicate, start up, to train or teach. Methuselah comes from two root meanings, either meaning man and weapon or perhaps death and shall bring, thus possibly meaning his death shall bring. Lamech comes from a suggested root meaning powerful or wild, perhaps lamenting or despairing. Noah, as is well known, comes from a root meaning to bring rest, relief, or comfort. Now, when you put those possible root meanings together, whether or not this is inaccurate, it's up to you to decide. But it says, from Adam to Noah, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching, and his death shall bring those despairing rest. 
I think that's true of Jesus Christ's first coming. We shouldn't place too much emphasis on the meanings of words and names, but it is interesting to see that if that is precisely what God meant, well, we certainly have that fulfilled in the New Testament when Jesus Christ came down and has given us peace and rest as we will be able to give to others in a few years' time.